What's going on, everybody? Welcome to Discover Point. So glad to have you guys with us this morning, especially if this is your first time joining us. My name is David. Uh, we're honored to have you as our guest this morning. If you guys would, if you're able to stand with me uh, just for the reading of God's Word this morning, we're looking at Colossians chapter 2. We are done with chapter 1. Yeah. Only took us a month to get through chapter 1. All right. So based on this uh, trajectory, it should take us another three months to get through Colossians. Uh, but that's okay, man. We're just, uh, we're just coasting through it, taking our time. Uh, if you missed last week's message, you need to go back and listen to it. It's such a great message by David Collinsworth. But let's listen to God's word this morning. Colossians chapter 2, starting from verse 1, says, For I want you to know how greatly I am struggling for you, for those in Laodicea, and for all who have not seen me in person. I want their hearts to be encouraged and join together in love so that they may have all the riches of complete understanding and have the knowledge of God's mystery, Christ. In him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I'm saying this so that no one will deceive you with arguments that sound reasonable. For I may be absent in the body, but I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see how well-ordered you are in the strength of your faith in Christ. So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, being rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught and overflowing with gratitude. Father, we love you. Thank you so much just for your amazing grace in our lives. We ask you, Father, now to just help us to learn from your word today. May your spirit make it come alive in us so that we can become more rooted and established in Christ today. In Jesus' name, amen. Look at your neighbor real quick as you're seated and say, the struggle is real. <laughs> the struggle is real. I'm going on, it'll be four years, I think, in August uh, since we moved up here. And it's kind of wild to think that that much time has flown by. In many ways, I feel like we're just getting started. In other ways, it feels like we've been here longer. It's just it's such a weird dynamic, but... You know, I, I grew up in ministry. As you guys know, my dad was a pastor. I've been around church and ministry all my life. There was a time in my life I did not want anything to do with ministry because I saw the struggles that my dad went through as a pastor. Literally, some major struggles. <laughs> Death threats, drama, people trying to split the church. I mean, all sorts of craziness. And so I was just like, yeah, it ain't for me. <laughs> nah, fam, I'm good. But then God called me into ministry. And when you're called, you're called. And there's no greater privilege in that. And so the last church that we were at, we had been there for several years, and we had no plans of ever leaving that church. Like, I mean, we, we saw God doing some incredible things. Our kids got baptized there. We, we had this great community. And, and so we had no plans. But then when God started putting it on our hearts and preparing us and like me having this sense of like, man, I feel like God's calling me out somewhere. I don't really know. And then one thing led to another. We ended up, you know, we heard about Discover Point. Well, through that process, my pastor that I, you know, I had served under, um, I was a campus pastor at one of their locations. And uh, we, he was great. He was super encouraging about everything, but we sat down and we still talk to this day, but we, we sat down. I'll never forget. He told me, he was like, hey man, this is awesome that you feel God calling you but are you sure <laughs> you know what you're getting yourself into? And in my mind, I'm like, well, I've been around my dad. I saw the struggles. I, you know, I've been in ministry for all these years. I know, right? He said, well, listen, it's, it's a different ball game, though, when you kind of become a lead pastor somewhere. And in my naivety, I was like, well, I know God's calling me, and it, he's calling me, and he's going to help me, Right? <laughs> And I say all that because here we are going into four years. And can I share, just be honest, like, man, the struggle is real at times. There, there's a weight and a burden uh, for being a pastor that sometimes you can't describe. And, and, and in this verse, you see Paul, and he says, for I want you to know how greatly I am struggling for you, for those in Laodicea and for those who have not seen me in, in person. 
Paul's talking about struggle, and, and just to kind of piggyback on last week, again, a great message. Paul had just talked about how he's rejoicing and suffering and how he's laboring in Christ for the sake of the big C church. He's seeing the gospel spread, and he's working hard, and it's by the grace of God and that he's doing all these things, but he's laboring, and then he goes along in this thought, and he says, I want you to know how greatly I'm struggling for you. Struggling. That word struggle is where we get our English word is translated from Greek to English is where we get the word agony. And it was used to describe athletes in the Olympics who were, who were striving for the prize, fighting for the championship. And they were agonizing. They were working hard and they were doing all these things. Paul's using this word and he's saying, I am struggling for you. He makes this super personal. You know, before, in the previous chapter, he's talking about how he's suffering for Christ in so many different areas for the Big C Church. But now he says, for you I'm struggling for. Not only for you Christians in Colossae, but also for the Christians in Laodicea, this neighboring town. He's not even seen these people. They've never even met him in person. And you really just see Paul's heart once again in this letter that he's written to them, and he's saying how concerned he is for them, that he is struggling so much for them. He is agonizing for them. Literally, he is sitting in a prison cell writing to these people that he's only heard about. He's heard about their faith. He's heard about their love for the saints. And yet, he's also hearing about these false teachers and this false doctrine that's infiltrated the church. And he's concerned. He's praying. He's agonizing. He's, he's writing this letter with tears. And he's saying, I'm struggling with you. You know, the call of ministry, it, it, it's a holy calling, Paul talks about. It's a great calling. There's no greater privilege than to be able to proclaim the gospel of Jesus. But the call to ministry is also comes with a price to pay. I, you know, I, I've talked to young guys before who, for whatever reason, I think in our culture and the way the American church is, we're all about like the celebrity pastor mentality. And it's like, I, I remember talking to some young college, Bible college students and talking to them and being like, I know some of you guys are attracted to ministry, and I don't mean this in an offensive way, so please, when I say this term, but you know, everyone uses that term sexy as if it's cool, and I was like, listen guys, I know you all think that ministry is sexy. It's not. Because they look at these celebrity preachers and these mega churches, and they see people, they see the crowds, they see the conferences, and they think that this is all there is to ministry. They think like, man, it's just about getting up for 30 minutes, 45 sometimes, give or take, every Sunday, and this is what we do. And people are attracted to that. Matter of fact, like there was a study that actually showed that like pastors struggle more with narcissism than most normal people. And I think it's because there's something about being able to talk to a crowd and woo a crowd and get people hyped up and, and then get people to pat you on the back and there's something that feeds their ego our ego and so people are so attracted to it and so they go into ministry for the wrong reasons and they think this is what it's all about they see the, the youtube influencers and and all these people and they're just like yeah man i want that this is a small part of ministry i mean don't get me wrong i love being able to proclaim the word of god i take it seriously but this is just a small part there's a weight and a burden and a struggle that comes with it and you hear Paul's heart in all this, and you hear his struggle, his concern, because he genuinely loves about the he loves the people that he is writing to, which is really the heart of a shepherd. And there's a struggle and a weight, and I think I speak. And as I was just reading these verses this week and meditating on it, it really just spoke to my heart. Because you hear Paul's heart and his concern, and really, like, as we're going through this today, I want you to hear not only my heart, but our hearts as elders, as staff. Like, this is our struggle for you. Like, we don't struggle, we don't work hard to try to be the coolest church on the block. We're not here to try to be relevant, try to have the biggest church. That's not our struggle. 
I could care less about being some mega church pastor or celebrity pastor or some influencer. That's not the struggle. Please don't get it twisted. Our struggle and our concern is for you and for your family, for your marriages, for your singleness, for our students, for our kids. There's a struggle. And my prayer is that as we're looking through these verses that you not only see Paul's struggle in context, but you hear our hearts for you. And so let's walk through this today. Paul's reason for struggling, and there's four things that, again, I feel really convey our hearts as pastors. And the first thing is this. He's struggling so that they would be encouraged and unified. That they would be encouraged and unified. He says in verse 2, he says, I want their hearts to be encouraged. These people I've never even met. I want you to be encouraged. And the reason why he wants them to be encouraged is because he knows that these false teachers have infiltrated the ranks and there's a lot of discouraged Christians in Colossae. Some of them are losing their faith. They're turning away from Christ. Some of them are discouraged. They're seeing their friends, their family members walking away from Jesus. What was once thriving and the gospel was bearing fruit, now it's being attacked and their community is being attacked and so they're discouraged. And Paul's praying, he's saying, I want them to be encouraged. And man, this is one of the tools of the enemy is he loves to bring discouragement and division to believers, to churches. Like he, he loves to do that. He loves to attack us individually so that it could affect us corporately. He loves to discourage Christians. One commentator says a, a discouraged Christian is someone who won't serve who won't, fight for them who won't fight for themselves spiritually, who is often prone to all types of sin. We take that even further. A discouraged Christian is someone who, who doesn't make church a priority anymore. A discouraged Christian is someone who isolates themselves from other believers, who doesn't want to get involved in the connect group. And Satan loves to try to discourage you. That's one of his major tools. Because if he could discourage us, he could get our eyes off of Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, and, and make us focus in on our problems and make it all about ourselves. He loves to discourage us. And Paul is saying his reason for struggling is that they would be encouraged, that their hearts would be encouraged. The word heart is more than just emotion. It's more than just a feeling. In, Greek, in the Greek mindset, which is what the New Testament was written in, the heart was used to describe the deepest part of a person, their soul. He's struggling so that their hearts, their souls, the deepest part of who they are would be encouraged in the Lord. And friends, can I tell you that that really speaks on our behalf as pastors, as elders, that man, we struggle because we want to see you encouraged in the Lord. We pray, we counsel, we preach, we proclaim, we meet with you, we call you, we text you, we try to follow up with you. We want you connected ultimately. Why? Because we want your hearts to be encouraged in the Lord. Some of us walked in here today, maybe you have felt so discouraged. Maybe it's not because of some false teaching, but maybe you're going through a t challenging situation. Maybe you've seen friends walking away from the faith. Maybe you're going through some type of suffering, some type of trial, some type of unanswered prayer. Maybe your marriage is falling apart. Maybe you're struggling in your singleness and feeling so alone and you are discouraged today. Maybe you are struggling with some type of sin. Can I tell you, friends, we are struggling for you, that your hearts would be encouraged. My hope and prayer today is that you would cast your cares upon the Lord. Psalms 55 says, cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. When we have a time of response in just a little bit, I really feel this strongly, but if you are struggling with discouragement or despair or depression, man, please come forward and let us pray for you today. Satan loves to discourage us, but the joy of the Lord is our strength. The joy of the Lord is our strength. 
that they would be encouraged and then he's and unified. He goes on to say, and join together in love. That word join together is this idea of being knit together. It's literally being united together. And Paul is concerned. Again, they're discouraged Christians. He wants to see them encouraged in the Lord and he wants to see them unified. Why? Because Satan knows that Satan's strategy is to divide and conquer. He loves to bring division amongst Christians, amongst churches. Someone once said that Sunday mornings are the most uh, divided uh, hour in all of, you know, every single Sunday, right? Because you have so many different people going to worship at their own denominations. We're all divided over doctrinal things. And, and Satan loves that. He loves to, to try to bring division, not only to the big C church, but also to local churches. And this false teaching that was spreading around was causing division, because you have people walking away from the truth and they're arguing about these things that, that matter and they're being divided over these things. And, and Paul is saying that I want to see you guys join together. I want to see you unified. Why? Because unity protects churches. Unity protects believers. When we're standing side by side, when we set aside our preferences, our differences, and we are fighting for the glory of God, Friends, can I tell you that this is a struggle that we struggle for? That we're constantly paying attention because to, to when the enemy's trying to infiltrate and cause problems and wreak havoc. Why? Because, man, we know what's at stake if he could get us divided. That's why Paul says in Philippians, he says, make every effort for the bond of unity. Satan loves to divide and conquer churches. This is one of the reasons why Jesus prayed in John 17 that we would be one. Do you realize that's the only prayer that Jesus prayed that's never been answered? Being one. Jesus prays that, and that's what we have to fight for. There are so many things. I think about our church, like, I mean, we're so blessed. Like, we have this diverse congregation, different backgrounds, perspectives, opinions, preferences, all these things. We cannot allow secondary minor issues to divide us. We have to fight for the gospel. And can I tell you, as a pastor, this is our struggle. That our church stays unified. I, you know, I'm thinking about 2024. Here we go, election year. We know what happened a couple years ago. Everybody started taking sides. All sorts of issues were coming up. Can I tell you, we're praying about those things already? <laughs> Not on our watch. We're praying for unity amongst believers. Paul's reason for struggling is that they would be encouraged and unified. The second thing is that they would be, that they would treasure Christ. He struggles for these believers so that they would treasure Christ. Just a couple of verses before, he says, and we proclaim him teaching everyone so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. He says in verse 2, he says, so that they may have all the riches of complete understanding and have the knowledge of God's mystery, Christ. What is he saying here? He's saying, I struggle, I work hard for you so that you would have all the riches of complete understanding. That, that idea there is having a full assurance or confidence in the gospel. Again, these false teachers were undermining the teaching of Jesus, the gospel causing these believers to be shaky in their faith, causing them to question, causing them to doubt. And Paul is saying here, I'm struggling so that you may have this complete understanding, this full assurance or confidence in the gospel and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ. And then listen to this. I love this verse. He says, in him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. These false teachers are basically saying that Christ wasn't enough, that there's some extra super spiritual things that you can experience that you could go deeper in. It's like, yeah, Jesus is, yeah, he was okay, but there's more. And Paul is saying, in Jesus, the mystery of God are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and understanding. He's basically saying that 
the value of the gospel can only be experienced in Christ. That true wisdom and knowledge is only found in Christ. Essentially, what he's calling for, what he's saying is that they would treasure Christ above all. In the 16th and 17th centuries, there was this group of uh, English Protestants, Christians, that broke away from the institution of the church, the Church of England. It had become corrupt. They had gotten away from the gospel. So these Puritans, they were just people that were zealous for God, right? Fought for religious freedom. They broke away. And man, they, they really influenced Christianity in, in, in early America. And one of the things that they said about the gospel, and I love this, they, they used to describe the, the, the gospel as like a diamond, as a multifaceted diamond. If you have a diamond on your ring, if you look at it right now, you know, you can look at the diamonds and you can see there's different facets, there's different angles, right, that make up the diamond. And what they're saying is that, and, and, and like, and, and so if you take that diamond, if you were to hold it up to the light, you could turn it around and you'd see a different perspective and, and it would shine on one facet and you'd see, you know, it sparkle over here and then you turn it around and then you'd see another aspect of the diamond and, and, the, and the beauty that it, it was instilled in all these different facets. And what they're saying is that the gospel is like a multifaceted diamond. There's so much to know about the gospel. It's this beautiful diamond. This is why Jesus said that the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure buried in a field. And what we ultimately see is that Christ is the treasure. The value of the gospel can only be experienced in Christ. And what Paul is struggling for, and our struggle for you, is that you would treasure Christ above all that you would treasure Jesus as supreme that you is as one pastor said see and savor Jesus that he would be the pearl of great price in your life that he would be the satisfier of your soul that he would be your treasure we're not here to make the best version of yourself that's what you came for Our goal is that you would treasure Jesus above all things, more than what this world has to offer. That is our struggle. That is our aim. That you would live your lives for the glory of Jesus. In him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. The third struggle that we see is that they would avoid deception He goes on in verse four. He says, I'm saying this, I'm saying all these things so that you, that no one will deceive you. That word deceive means literally be led astray by a false reasoning. He says, I'm saying this so that no one will deceive you with arguments that sound reasonable. Friends, I want you to understand something. Like there are several warnings in the New Testament about believers becoming deceived. Like, that's a thing. <laughs> that's why, like, this is the reason why this letter was written, because there was believers or people that claimed to follow Christ that were being deceived, that were being led astray. And we constantly see these warnings. These warnings aren't just for then, they're also for now. And what we need to understand is that Satan is an angel of, a, of light, and he is a master manipulator. He is a deceiver. And can I tell you, he knows Scripture way better than you. You remember when he tempted Jesus? What was he doing? He was taking scripture. He knows scripture. So just because it sounds good doesn't mean that, mean, mean that it's truth. He is a deceiver. He is an angel of light. And what he will do is that he will present counterfeit gospels and teachings and principles that sound really good, that appeal to our flesh. They have just a little bit of truth mixed in. But they're not true. They're not founded on Christ. They're not founded on the gospel. You know, not too long ago, um, we had some Jehovah, Jehovah's Witnesses that came to our door. And uh, of all doors to come to, right? Come to a pastor's house. And, um, you know, it was like a Saturday. And, of course, I'm tired. 
I said, I, like I had just woken up. I don't look like a pastor at 9 o'clock in the morning on Saturdays, contrary to popular opinion, you know. Um, and, you know, they come to my door, and I didn't want to talk to them. To be honest, my flesh was like, man, just go to another door. But I'm like, ah, I got to, you know. This is, it's like, okay, God, I'm just going to take advantage of this. And so I opened up the door, and they're trying to convert me. They're talking about what they believe, Jehovah's Witnesses. And, and, um, and essentially, Jehovah's Witnesses, they, they don't believe that Christ is God. They, they did not deny his deity, which is very similar to this false teaching that was infiltrating the Nos, uh, infiltrating the Colossians church. It's very similar to, to Mormonism and uh, Church of Scientology. A lot, you will find that that is a common denominator with a lot of cults, a lot of false religions, that they deny the deity of Christ, right? And so we're talking, and I know just enough to be able to like converse with them and like, you know, challenge them on some things. And so we're, we're challenging them. I'm trying to be kind and cordial and everything like that. And all of a sudden, this precious, sweet lady probably like in her early 60s, sweet lady. She stopped. She said, you know what? I used to be an evangelical Christian just like you. I grew up in church, but I found a better way. And man, my heart just broke. Just broke. And so like you see this idea of like just avoiding deception. And again, only God knows who is truly saved and who's not saved and everything like that. I don't understand how that all works. But man, we see someone and she claimed to be a follower of Christ and she, he or she is now caught up in deception. Like that is a thing. And our struggle for you is that you would avoid deception. This is one of the reasons why we are constantly just preaching through the word of God. Because we want to teach you sound doctrine. Paul tells uh, Timothy that it's down do sound doctrine that saves the hearers, that's able to save its hearers. This is why we're committed to the Word of God. We teach through the Word of God. Why? Because we want to see you avoiding deception. And listen, maybe it's not some kind of false teaching or bazaar, whatever. Maybe it's just some type of cultural influence and cultural lie. There's plenty of false philosophies out there. Not too long ago, we... Uh, my, my wife is friends with a, a, a lady, lives in another state, who's a single, older lady. And um, she's been part of a, a large church for years. And she was in a small group with Christians. And they were talking about, like, their dating experience. And, and they're all singles. And, 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 and she was complaining. She was like, yeah, it seems like, you know, I'm on these dating apps, like Christian dating apps. And these guys that are Christians, all they're wanting to do is sleep with me. And to her surprise, like, the ladies in her group were just like, well, that's kind of normal now. Like, what's wrong with that? My friends, like, that's what I'm taught. Like, the cultural influences that are shaping and molding believers that are contrary to God's word. We could go on and on about, you know, gender and sexuality and marriage, all these things. And friends, we have to guard ourselves. Because it's a thing. And I share this, and I know it's not popular, but honestly, I could care less because my struggle as a pastor is that you won't be deceived, that you're walking in truth. Paul says elsewhere in Corinthians, he says, I fear that as a serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your minds may be, by, may be seduced by a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. He goes on to say in verse 5, he says, For I may be absent in a body, but I'm with you in the Spirit, rejoicing to see how well-ordered you are. See, despite his concern, he has a joyful anticipation of their continued faithfulness in Christ. He says, How well-ordered you are in the strength of your faith in Christ. He wants them to avoid deception and then, verse, and then the last thing that we see, his struggle, is that they would continue to walk in him. That they would continue to walk in Christ. Listen, verse 6, he says, So then, just as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord. So he's talking to believers. Just as you've received Christ. And we're, we, we talk a lot of it around here about, like, we think it's so important that you've had a moment. Like, can you remember the time that you placed your faith in Jesus? And Paul's 
you know, he's saying this just as you receive Christ. It's almost like he's saying, do you remember that moment when you first gave your life to the Lord? How many of you guys remember that moment? I know for me, I was, again, I grew up in church, but I, I think I was, like, I was like six or seven years old, and I'll never forget, man. I don't remember all the details of the message, but I remember being in children's church, and I remember feeling conviction of sin and putting my trust in Jesus. I remember going down to an altar. I remember that at a moment. Some of us, we, 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 you know, we can recall those moments, and that, that matters. Like, have you had a moment, Right? where you had a genuine conversion to Jesus. And he says, so then just as you received Christ, listen to what he says. Just like that moment when you first received Jesus, continue to walk in him. Continue to walk in him. Friends, listen, this is a call to persevere in the faith, to continue to walk in him. The idea is this continued trust in Jesus. Matter of fact, it's reinforced by that word that he uses for the word walk, which conveys the idea to live a course of life. Essentially, what Paul is saying, hey, okay, cool. Like when you first got saved, now continue to live your life unto Jesus. Continue daily trusting in him. Continue to persevere in the faith. This is why we like to say around here, you know, part of our mission statement, it says, or our mission statement actually says, inviting all people into a life fully devoted to Jesus. Like Christianity is more than just a one-time decision. It's a lifestyle of devotion unto Jesus where we are continuing to walk and trust and believe and worship and treasure Jesus. And listen, I, I believe in eternal security. I really do. I believe that the evidence of our security in Christ is that we continue to trust in him. And this is why we see these calls to persevere in the faith. Jesus said, all those who endure to the end will be saved. And nowadays, friends, we see so many people who are walking away. That begs the question, well, were they truly saved or not? <laughs> that only God knows. All I know is that we have to continue to walk. We have to continue to trust. We have to continue to pursue holiness. He says, continue to walk in him. And then, then he says this, and he tells us how. He says, being rooted. I love this picture. Being rooted. How many guys have ever uh, like seen large trees? That is me, uh, believe it or not. That was probably about... I don't know, 10, 15 years ago. That was before I had a full-grown beard. I love trees. There's something about trees. Ever since I was a kid, you know, I was always just enamored by, like, huge, massive trees, like huge oak trees, you know? And we were hiking, and this is in Alabama, and we were hiking. Man, I came across this huge oak tree. And you can see, like, the roots are massive. And so I climb up there, and I'm just blown away by the magnitude of this tree the roots that are growing down deep into the soil. And this tree has obviously been there for hundreds of years. If you know anything about the Mobile Bay area, there's a lot of hurricanes that have come through there. The weather is unpredictable. And that tree has stood the test of time. You know why? Because it has deep roots. And Paul is using this imagery from agriculture and he's describing the life that we should live as believers. If we're going to continue to walk in Jesus, we have to grow our deeps, our, our roots deep down in him. We have to be rooted in Christ. This is why Jesus said to abide in him. Paul is using some imagery here that you see back in Psalms chapter 1 where he says this, where the psalmist said, How happy is the one who does not walk in the way does not walk in the advice of the wicked or stand in the pathway with sinners or sit in the company of mockers. Instead, his delight is in the Lord's instruction and he meditates on it day and night and he is like a tree planted, planted by flowing streams that bears its fruit in the season and its leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. And this is a picture of what God desires for us, that we are rooted in Jesus, that we're unshakable. No matter what comes our way, persecution, trials, tribulations, 
friends walking away, man letting us down, that we're immovable, we're unshakable, that we're rooted in Christ. Friends, this is our desire for you. Verse 4, listen to this. The wicked are not like this. Instead, they are like chaff that the wind blows away. See, friends, God doesn't want us to be like tumbleweeds. It, there's a lot of people who claim to follow Christ, and man, their lives look like this. Man, they're just constantly going with the culture, trying out new religions, trying out different things. They're just blown around. Paul's saying, we want your life to be rooted. He says elsewhere in Ephesians 4, he's, he talked about just becoming more mature in Christ. He says, then we, will be no, then we will no longer be little children tossed by the waves and blown around by every wind of teaching, by human cunning with cleverness in the techniques of deceit. And God wants us to be rooted in Christ, not tumbleweeds. That's what he desires for us. This is what we desire for you. Then he goes on to say, here's the second thing that he says about continuing to walk in him. Not only are we rooted, he says, and built up in him. This idea that we know that Christ is the cornerstone. He's the firm foundation. And Paul is now saying that you would now build your life on Jesus. Remember what Jesus said? The wise man builds his house upon the rock. He was talking about himself and that our lives would be built on Jesus. Not only our lives, but our marriages would be built on Jesus. That our singleness would be built on Jesus. That our parenting would be built on Jesus. That our households would be, would be built on Jesus. That our decision making would be built on Jesus. That our careers are even built on Jesus. That we are building everything upon a sure foundation. And friends, this is what we desire for you. That you're built on Christ. And then he says, established in the faith just as you were taught. Established in the faith just as you were taught. And overflowing with gratitude overflowing with gratitude. Man, that statement right there, it's this idea of just gratitude. How gratitude really fuels our relationship with the Lord. It literally helps us to continue to walk in Christ. You know what I'm saying? There's something about gratitude, like just reminding yourself of what God has done. Even on our worst days, we always still have something to be grateful for. Even on our worst days. You know, I, 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 look at, I, I look at people like Christians that have suffered and gone through hardships and trials. I mean, I'm always inspired by them because that, it's like their faith is real. You know what I mean? It's one thing to, it's one thing to worship Jesus when everything's going great, but can, but can we worship him when we're going through tough times? And I, I've witnessed this like even with like my own mother-in-law and her trial and struggle with cancer and like how she was still like going through chemo and all these trials and situations and the pain and everything and she was still like man waking up every morning she'd have her bible out with her coffee she was listening to somebody on she was listening to a preacher or she was just constantly feeding herself with god's word and whenever she would pray she would just have these tears of gratitude in her life for the lord there's something about that. I, if I'm honest, uh, last Sunday I didn't have to preach, which, which was probably, it was great. It was nice to not have to preach sometimes. I, I love the fact, I love it when David preaches. always does a great job and, and did such a great job talking about suffering. But, but like that week leading up to it, man, I, I just went through it. It was one of those weeks that we had off, but coming off of Easter, like Easter was a high and then it was like, Boo, you know what I mean? It was like, and I just remember just, just feeling, just feeling, just different attacks, just part of it, just happens. I just remember walking in last Sunday, just honestly, if I'm just being completely honest, okay, I didn't even really feel like being here. Pastor, you can't say that. I'm human. But it was just one of those moments of just like, oh, just feeling. And I, last 
week, and David, again, hearing the message was so good for my soul. But then during, time of, during the time of worship, especially in the 11 o'clock service, we were singing gratitude. And man, dude, it's just like I just got overwhelmed. It's like my perspective change and it was just reminding myself of who God is and the gospel I mean and it just fueled my soul and then taking communion and I'm saying all this to say this is one of the reasons why we sing why we worship why we offer communion why because it's a it's an opportunity to overflow with gratitude and there's something about that in our lives when we practice gratitude on a daily basis weekly basis that continues to fuel our faith in Jesus. Friends, in closing, Father, we come to you right now. We're so grateful for your kindness and your goodness and your mercy. Father, you know every situation, every struggle, every trial. And I pray, oh God, that during this next few moments that your spirit would just work in people's lives. with every head bowed and eye closed today we want to have a chance to respond we're not going to do anything weird our worship team is going to lead us in this next song as a time of response and if you're here today I mean we have three responses the first one is for anyone that doesn't know Jesus that today you would begin to build your life on Jesus by putting your faith in him it's just a matter even in this moment to call upon Jesus and say Jesus save me we want to encourage you to do that today maybe you're here today You've been going through it. You're discouraged. You're tired. You are weary. We want to invite you to come forward in just a moment. Receive prayer. These altars are open just to spend time with the Lord. And then lastly, may we just overflow today with gratitude through the gospel, through the communion. If you're a believer here today, we want to invite you to reflect on the death and resurrection of Jesus. No greater way to express your appreciation than through that. You can look at me. Listen, church, we love you. We care about you. We're fighting for you guys. Now, let's spend the next few moments, let's reflect on what Jesus has done for us, that he's our firm foundation. Amen. Why don't you stand? We want to invite you now to come forward.